So I've tried to look in this book at where they come from. You know, did they just evolve by chance? And if so, how? Um, when did the first eggs appear in the record, fossil uh, record of, of this planet? Might there be eggs on other planets? You know, what, what is an egg and how is it so complicated? How did it evolve? What's the evidence for its evolution? Um, this raises huge questions for the philosophy of science. And it raises lots of very interesting questions about, about embodiedness and, and spirit matter junctions. Um, and the book originally was going to have a se sequence of tiered essays by a scientist, natural scientist, who was explaining the way eggs work, and me going into the religious symbology and psychology of the egg. Unfortunately, the chap withdrew just at the last minute before publication for reasons he's not explained, and um, therefore it's, it's, it doesn't matter, it's still quite a substantial book. So it has these, these gaps where some of the scientific information should have been, which is frustrating. I mean, of course I could probably write them myself, but that would take another year or two, and I'm, I'm busy, and I don't have time to do the in-depth research I would like. And I'm not, you know, a scientific expert in... <clears throat> microstructures of, of organic matter. So if anyone out there wants to step forward and is a scientist and understands how eggs work, then please get in touch. You're welcome to complete the missing chapters. But I'm going to publish it as it is because it's still pretty interesting. There is a chapter by a scientific colleague of mine from Slovenia who's done a chapter on what eggs are made of. She's an expert in protein structure. Eggs are mainly made of protein. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's been a vehicle for some very interesting discussions and reflections. And this last week I've been finishing my last chapter of this book. And I have to say, I found it absolutely fascinating to research. And I keep finding stuff that just, I, I keep thinking, gosh, you know, this is amazing. Why has nobody told me this before? Um, so... What I've been discovering this last week, I want to say a couple of things, is the importance of the god Farnes. Now, I've always known about Farnes in the back of my mind. He was a very important god in the Orphic traditions. He was essentially the creator of the universe in the Orphic traditions. And I've always known about him, but I, didn't, I don't think I quite clocked how important this guy is, this deity. Um... And the word Farnes comes from the same root as, as um, light, shining, um, as in the word ph phenomenology. Um, and um, all the words that have that same root mean shining and light. So Farnes is essentially a god of light. And he's identified in uh, early Greek tradition. He comes from the cosmic egg. Right, he suddenly appears, the god of light, um, and he's shown in iconography in that guise, surrounded by an egg, um, standing in the middle. He's often got a serpent coiled around him, um, <clears throat> and he then later was assimilated to Mithras, who was another god of light that the the Roman Empire really fell in love with. And therefore, Mithras and Farnes become essentially the same deity. And we find very interesting bas reliefs in Mithraean temples uh, scattered around the Roman Empire, with Farnes and Mithras identified specifically. That, that you know, this is Farnes, Mithras. They're one deity, and that's been found at Hadrian's Wall, way up in the north of England. There was a Mithra um, temple there with this image of Farnes, right? Uh, there's been one found in Modena in Italy as well. Now, this is very interesting to me. The, the god of the egg, the god who comes from the egg, is, is cosmic light, cosmic intelligence, actually. And later, he's then identified with Sol Invictus, the sun, the supreme sun that we celebrated last weekend in our, well, the weekend before in our wonderful Midsummer Solstice Festival with speakers online from all over the world. Uh, and the, the Druids, you know, like me, we celebrate the soul, Invictus, who is Fardes, 
who is Mithras. Now, when Constantine was a baby growing up on his you know, mother and father's knee, he was taught, yeah, you can worship Farnes, Mithras, Sol Invictus, but it took form as Christ. That was his mother always piping up, Helena, saying, yeah, you do realise that your dad's deity, this Sol Invictus thing, he actually took form as Jesus. And look, here's his book, The Gospels. So Constantine, when he joined the Roman army and fought his way up it and became a good initiate of Mithras, Farnes, Sol Invictus and all the rest of it, eventually, in a dream, note, in a dream, he realises in a blinding flash, hey, that Jesus of Nazareth, he is Farnes on earth. And so we're going to legalise that tradition that my mother belongs to, that obscure thing called Christianity. And we're going to allow them to have their, you know, uh, basilicas and churches and all the rest of it. And we're even going to try and knock some sense into all their rival sects. We'll have a council in Nicaea and one in Constantinople and so on. So, so Constantine was a, a worshipper of Sol Invictus, Mithras, Farnes, like any good self-respecting initiate in the Roman hierarchy, who realised that Christ was also a manifestation, an epi a, a phenomenological manifestation of that primal um, logos, effectively. Now, I think this is all very interesting. And so here I am, researching it away, writing it up for my book. And then I, I do what I often do. I go to my collective works of Jung, and I look up Farnes, and, you know, Jung's always got there about 50 years before I've got there. <coughs> and I wanted to know, has anyone written the history of Farnes? No, they haven't yet. Where's Carl Karenyi's history of Farnes? He, he, he's done one on Dionysus, one on Hermes. Antoine Ferre did one on Hermes. Nobody's written the book of Farnes. Now, there's a little clue. Somebody should do that. Jung could have done, but he's dead now. So anyway, what Jung did, did write in his wonderful book, Symbols of Transformation, uh, one of the great books of, of um, Jung's amazing oeuvre, is he went into Farnes in detail. I'm going to read the paragraph and then comment on it. Um, it's in the section of Symbols of Transformation on the concept of libido. <clears throat> Numerous mythological and philosophical attempts have been made to formulate and visualise the creative force which man knows only by subjective experience. To give but a few examples, I would remind the reader of the cosmogonic uh, significance <coughs> of Eros in Hesiod, and also of the Orphic figure of Farnes. The Shining One, the first created, the father of Eros. Orphically, too, he has the significance of Priapus. He is bisexual and equated with the Theban Dionysus Lysias. The Orphic significance of Farnes is akin to that of the Indian god Kama, the god of love, who is likewise a cosmogonic principle. Now that's fascinating, and you know, one could write the first chapter of the book on that. I mean, Farnes as <clears throat> father of Eros, he's, he's Priapus, he's the phallic god, um, he's, he's that energy that worships the egg, right? Um, you can't have an egg without sperm, right? So sperm is Farnes' um, department, and that's the male lover of the goddess, which is often neglected. A lot of you know, New Age types are into their goddesses, but they forget you need actually the male as well. You need your priapus, you need your farmers. Um, and they're both implicit from the very beginning. Um, <clears throat> so it's fascinating. And, and in the Hindu traditions, he's Kama, the whence Kama Sutra, you know. Now it goes on. To the Neoplatonist Plotinus, the world's soul is the energy of the intellect. He compares the one, the primordial creative principle, with light. 
the intellect with the sun, S-U-N, and the world's soul with the moon. Or again, he compares the one with the father and the intellect with the fis, the sun, S-O-N. The one, designated as Uranos, is transcendent. The fis, the sun, Kronos, has domination over this visible world and the world's soul, Zeus, is subordinate to him. The one, or the usia of existence, in totality, is described by Plotinus as hypostatic. And so are the three forms of emanation. Thus we have one being in three hypostases. As Drews has observed, this is also the formula for the Christian trinity as laid down at the councils of Nicaea and Constantinople. We might add that certain early Christian sects gave a maternal significance to the Holy Ghost, world soul, or moon. Now that's, again, fascinating. That's a whole chapter on Farnes. Um, and this is studying Plotinus, um, who was the first really thinker, I think, to coin the word archetype, by the way. I think Jung based his theory of archetypes on his very close and detailed reading of, of Plotinus. Um, <clears throat> and Plotinus has this wonderful worldview whereby the one, the cosmic, you know, um, the, the Tohen of Plato, <coughs> then manifests down through a series of stepped emanations into this world where I'm sitting with a body talking to you and you're listening hopefully with a body and, you know, etc. How do we get from the one to here? Well, Plotinus could explain it through this, this triplicate down falling like a waterfall in three parts, a bit like Pistith Rider in Wales where I used to go and do my druid prayers. It has, it's the tallest waterfall in Europe, but it cheats because it's got three little steps, you know. It doesn't all come down in one whoosh. Um, so that's how we can think of the one manifesting. Um, and the intellect is the son of the father. And, you know, Jung, ever a clever guy, immediately clocks, well, hang on, isn't that like Christianity? Isn't that like the Trinity? And yes, of course it is. I mean, what's so important, and one could write reams of this, is how the concept of the Trinity was already there in Neoplatonism. There's nothing new about the Trinity idea. And in my book on Principia Religio Mathematica, which I'm working on, I'm going to be explaining how the Trinity idea is there in, in Indian thought, in Greek thought, and so on. It, it comes into Christianity because, like anyone with any sense knows, that reality comes in threes. It was there in the Druid teachings, which was again a triplicate concept of, of there. It's in Wicca with the mother maiden crone, the three forms of the goddess. Um, and it's there in Egyptian um, cosmology, hence the importance of the pyramid and the triangle. Um, so it's a cosmic insight that the universe comes in threes. And um, here it is popping up in Plotinus. Eventually the Christians, you know, <clears throat> essentially plagiarised the idea, actually. And, uh, and that's what Jung knew very well. <laughs> um, but he goes on. It's interesting. The Holy Ghost seems to be the feminine, maternal thing. The Ruach HaKodesh is indeed feminine in Aramaic and Hebrew. According to Plotinus, Jung continues, the world soul has a tendency towards separation and divisibility. The sinna qua non of all change, creation and reproduction. It is an unending all of life and holy energy. A living organism of ideas which only become effective and real in it. The intellect is its progenitor and father. And what the intellect conceives... The world's soul brings to birth in reality. What lies enclosed in the intellect comes to birth 
in the world soul as logos fills it with meaning and makes it drunken as if with nectar. Now that's a quote from Plotinus right now. I love that quote. So what lies enclosed in the intellect comes to birth in the world soul as logos fills it with meaning and makes it drunken as if with nectar. Nectar, like Soma, Jung continues, is the drink of fertility and immortality. The soul is fructified by the intellect. As the oversoul, it is called the heavenly Aphrodite. As the undersoul, the earthly Aphrodite. Well, this is pretty cosmic stuff, folks, and it's very interesting if we go back to the question of what is the work of the World Intellectual Forum. Well, we're trying to bring birth to peace. <laughs> and Plotinus is like he's giving us our marching orders. He's saying that as intellectuals, our duty is to channel that cosmic intellect from the One, the Father, whatever you want to say, the Allah, the God, the Godhead, the Absolute. Channel that down into the world of intellect that we humans can cope with and then give birth to that in the world of reality through the world soul, i.e. peace, plenty, end of unemployment, social development, a green New Deal planet, end of racism, end of injustice. You know, all the things we want, or those of us that have tuned into our intellects and cosmic consciousness want. I mean, you know, the, the kind of the, um, uh, there are these wreckers still, you know, who haven't, quite got to the uh, reading of the right hymn book yet um, but I'm hoping that the purpose I do these talks and my books and so on is to gradually hopefully it'll trickle out filter out um, you know <clears throat> and um, so the heavenly Aphrodite is 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 the, is the way that that world soul interacts with with the higher logos um, and that's why, you know, in Renaissance art, why the tragedy of the sack of Rome, what they were doing with their images of beauty and, and um, you know, Botticelli, the birth of Venus and so on. These were Neoplatonic erotic symbols of the birth of that higher um, heavenly Aphrodite. Um, but who can also take form in, you know, your lover, your mistress, your wife, um, your boyfriend, whatever. And... Um, Raphael painted, you know, this wonderful picture of his, his mistress. And there's another wonderful painting from that time, um, which I've discovered. Um, Simonetta Vespucci um, was known as the most sexy, gorgeous, beautiful woman in Florence at the time. She was painted, again, bare-breasted, unbelievably to die for, exquisite. Well, her cousin was Amerigo de Vespucci, whose name is in America. Amerigo, America. America was the cousin of this exquisite Florentine beauty. He was painted by many artists as a quintessence of that, you know, Aphrodite Urania meets Aphrodite, you know, Pandemos, the, the actual real flesh and blood woman. Her story is a bit sad. She died quite young. She married um, into the Vespucci family and um, met Amerigo, who was a... Um, you know, a highly intellectual man, a student of the Academy in Florence and so on. I would love to make a movie about Amanico de Vespucci and his Florentine background and weave in Simonetta and, you know, her wedding, which was everyone who was anybody went to it and there were masks and balls and you name it to die for. Make a great movie and I think the Americans should pay for that movie and we'll do it in Hollywood and Florence, shoot it in both. Because that's the founding father of America, for God's sake, and his amazing history, which nobody's ever made a movie of. You know, I mean, what is it with people? Well, is everyone asleep? You know. <laughs> so they made endless war movies and, and gangster movies and mobster movies, you know. Um, let's have some movies about the beauty of what I'm talking about, the heavenly Aphrodite. Anyway, Jung goes on, he says... <clears throat> This earthly Aphrodite, well, she knows the pangs of birth. You know, that's the real embodiedness of us. It is not without reason 
that the dove of Aphrodite is the symbol of the Holy Ghost. You know, master of understatement. That, that paragraph I've just read out is, is a masterly work of understatement because every sentence in it is charged with layers and layers of depth and, and significance. Um, so I think that book on Farnes needs to be done and that paragraph is its sort of foundational um, you know, text if you want. Um, so these are just some of the things I've been enjoying working on this last week on my Book of the Egg. The other thing I'm working on is coming up to my Mary Magdalene Studies Association conference because of course, you know, as someone interested in esoteric Christianity and the feminine side of, of the Holy Spirit, and I'm all very interested in the Mary Magdalene tradition, the Gospel, the Gnostic tradition. And therefore I founded with, with the colleagues um, the Mary Magdalene Studies Association, which is the first time anyone's either thought of it or done it. I mean, I'm as an intellectual, I think of something and then I do it. You know, I, I also work in the real world. Um, <clears throat> and we have a brilliant conference coming up on July 22nd, which is her feast day. I'll be doing a talk along with many other great, um, you know, contemporary students and experts on Mary Magdalene. Um, we have one lady who's doing a PhD at the Pacifica Graduate Institute, uh, which is a great place for union studies in California. Um, <clears throat> and um, there's some brilliant work going on, actually, in the Pacifica Graduate Institute, which is all on lockdown, of course. Um, and uh, some, of the, some of the scholars there are, you know, top-notch, really. Um, one of the books they've just produced is a thing called The Varieties of Mythical Experience, uh, which is a very interesting study of, it's taking William James' idea, the varieties of religious experience, and saying there are different ways we can, you know, inhabit myth in human history and culture. You know, myth operates in this way for the Shinto culture, this way for the Celtic Druid culture, this way for the Greeks and so on. Uh, one of the very interesting essays in that is called The Myth of Monotheism by Christine Downing, who is a scholar at Pacifica Graduate Institute. And she's of a Jewish origin. She did her PhD on Martin Buber, who I mentioned earlier. But it's very interesting. She's applying the tools of Jungian analytical psychology to look at biblical studies and say, well, hang on, isn't the Bible itself a kind of myth? You know, it has this, I mean, in biblical studies and conventional theology, the Bible is true, and the one God is true, and all the other gods are false, and all the myths are false, but the Bible is true, and it's not myth at all, no Adam and Eve, etc. Whereas if we actually turn that on its head, we can see that, hang on, the Bible is full of myths, teeming with them. And the whole thing is actually a myth. The myth of the one God is actually also a myth. The myth of the Yahweh, who is a... Uh, you know, one God among many <clears throat> in the beginning period. So her essay on that is absolutely to die for interesting. And it fits with my research on, on Robert Graves and Raphael Patai's book, The Hebrew Myths. They tried to do a study of the myths of the Bible in as much detail as Graves had done on the Greek myths, but of course they didn't finish, you know. You'd have to have a mastery of all the um, Zohar, the Kabbalistic texts, the Talmud, all the different Jewish legends and, and myths that are handed down, many of them orally, um, it still needs to be done. Uh, Moses Gaster, who was a great um, uh, founder of religious studies at uh, um, university in, in um, New York, <clears throat> a sister university to Columbia University, it's a woman only university, it was in those days, um, he wrote a book on the original myths behind the Bible, and he compared and contrasted them with other Near Eastern traditions like um, in Syriac culture and the uh, Rashamra texts, and he wanted to explain it all as a sort of theatre, the, the battle of the gods for who gets the goddess, essentially. Each generation has to battle, and then the winner gets the goddess. That's basically the story of Middle Eastern religions whether it's Sumerian, Babylonian, Mesopotamian, Syrian, or biblical. And Gaster argued that this was then reenacted in the temple cult um, as, you know, the good god, Yahweh, defeats the bad god, who's the 
a kind of demon serpent off at sea, the Leviathan or whatever. Very interesting work that uh, Moses Gasser did, and um, you know, it still still repays reading in detail. And somebody's got to put all this stuff together and, and <coughs> come up with a theory. <laughs> um, one chap who could have done but didn't is Derrida, the great French intellectual. Um, but one thing Derrida did do in his own stubborn and opaque way is he realised that nestling behind language concepts are pictures. That words, in his study of grammatology and all the rest, words are, they, they conceal and hide as much as they say. Because to really see something is to see the picture of it. So I'm talking about really complicated stuff here, but if you can see the pictures as I'm sketching them, then you'll see where I'm going. You know, that's called intellectual insight, perception, which Derrida realizes is literally a seeing. Now, the word idea means that it's a seeing, it's a visual thing. Um, so this is why I'm explaining in my book of the egg that behind a lot of the myths and religious symbols, actually, the egg lurks. And that's why it's one of the very earliest symbols that our ancestors, 40,000 years ago in South Africa, we scratched on ostrich eggs complex patterns that Dean Leprini reckons are to do with the solar path of the equinoxes and so on. Um, they found in these caves 40,000 BC, 50, 60,000 BC, ostrich eggs, which are the oldest, oldest um, you know, artworks known to humanity, um, and were painted on eggs. So they had this cos cosmic significance, right, right from early on. And that's why the egg turns up. That's why Mary Magdalene holds the egg in iconographic art. And that's why Farnes comes from the egg. Right? <clears throat> um, and that's why Brahma is shaped like an egg in some Hindu schools. In my commentaries on the Upanishads, I'm going into that in detail. So look... Um, <clears throat> this is all quite interesting, and I hope that will be a feast of ideas, you know, uh, that Mary Magdalene Studies Association conference on July 22nd. We hope to have then, possibly, if we're all free, another one down in person in October in the south of, southwest of France. We'll see if that's possible. Um, so what's wrong with racism? What's wrong with that policeman? I mean, you know, the whites are best, aren't they? I mean, why shouldn't we oppress the blacks? from what I'm saying, from the perspective of universalism that I'm coming from, from the, the integration of all the ancient wisdom traditions on the planet, which we also had in our Stonehenge Solstice discussion, people from India, Slovenia, um, you know, South Africa, and America, and so on, <clears throat> uh, and Britain. Um, no, what's wrong with racism is not only it's a moral, you know, ignorance, but it's also an epistemological affront to our collective intelligence. Our wisdom as people is universal, whatever the colour of our skin. And the wisdom traditions of all humanity point to the same universal common origin. So the hermetic traditions of Africa, the ancient Egyptian traditions that Credo uh, Mutua, the teacher of Dean Leprini, and the Sangomas of Africa, some of whose disciples I've met um, and have receive teaching from. So, you know, these people consciously have an oral tradition going back to ancient Egypt, still alive in their initiatory circles in the Zulu people and other of the, you know, migratory peoples around Africa. Um, they haven't forgotten the wisdom of Osiris and Isis. They're still there. Um, so that's that, and wisdom is wisdom is wisdom, whether it's black or white or blue or green or pink, you know, it's the rainbow wisdom. Same with India, uh, the wisdom traditions of India show the same roots as the African, and the same as the Chinese, again, the wisdom of um, Fu Si, who, who founds Chinese civilization, and who the Jesuits, when they got to China, decided it must be Enoch, because he does the same stuff that Enoch does. Um, the whole Judeo-Christian Islamic tradition that we inherit is so profoundly multi-textured and multicultural. 
I mean, I'm glad to see Welby now saying, well, Jesus might have been a bit brown, actually. He might not have been pure white. You know, <laughs> well, OK, you know, the point is it doesn't matter. Why are all these black Madonnas and, and black Mary Magdalene statues all over France? Well, because, you know, black is beautiful. Black is an amazing, holy, sacred colour. And the reason black was colour uh, of sacredness in Egypt is because it's the colour of the land, the chem. Al chem means the black science. Because the pupil of my eye, if you look at my eye, you know, it's black. Because that can absorb the light. So the black colour is the holiest of all colours because it means it's in love with light so much it absorbs it. And, and the black consciousness that this man, this stupid policeman, was oppressing, that man, George Floyd, to me is a living saint. I love that man, this Christian guy who was working with the homeless, drug addicts, to be snuffed out like that and killed when he had so much more love in his heart and he was crying for his mum, you know. To me, that just symbolises the tragic ignorance that the white people have got to with their racist arrogance. And I'm ashamed of it because, you know, my skin is technically white-ish. And, and yet, they're my brothers and sisters misbehaving like that. Wake up, people. You know, as a druid, I'm saying those guys need to really, you know, go back and do some homework and get with the universal wisdom tradition. White is not my, no, Mr. Trump, you know. <laughs> it's, it's the rainbow that we want, the universal, multi-textured, multi-coloured beauty of all existence. And um, Newton knew that. Dear old Isaac, <clears throat> who was a great expert, he would love what I'm talking about, he would, you know, totally get it. Newton, whose house and manor I've been to, where he did all his research on lockdown, hiding from the plague, Newton discovered the laws of gravity and also colour and optics there. And he worked out that all the colours we see, you know, red, blue, green, they all come from the one white light, which you can work out in the prism. He was the first guy ready to study all that and work it out. <clears throat> and to then ask, well, how does it work? You know, what are these rays? What is light? Well, Newton then wrote a book saying that the same is true of all the religions. Each religion, Islam, Judaism, Christianity, whatever, they're just like a different colour. Paganism, Orphism, Hermeticism, Chinese philosophy, Taoism, you know, Shintoism, etc., etc., Druidry. They're all just different colours coming from the one ultimate, absolute white light that, that um, you know, is so bright it can't be seen or looked at directly, so we have to look at the colours. And... Um, <clears throat> That was Newton's genius, and his colleagues told him not to publish it, Isaac, it's too dangerous. Put that away in the desk. And it was never published till 1954 by the University of Liverpool. I think Newton should have been braver and published it, actually. Um, but, you know, that's why I'm trying to do my Principia Religio Mathematica. I'm trying to complete the bit he finished. He ended Principia Mathematica just where it gets interesting, where he speculates on the nature of how God manifests the geometry of space, time, and motion, and gravity. That's where I'm starting my book. So anyway, yeah, racism is just stupid, it's just ignorant, and we should be affirming the rainbow complexity of, of the beauty of all of us, you know, Chinese, Japanese, Polynesian, uh, you know, Scottish, Hebrew, Israeli, Palestinian, you know, Syriac, Yazidi, Zoroastrian, Persian, you know, study the beauty of all this. Uh, they're all manifestations of the one farmes in my, you know, theological terminology, so to speak, and, and the cosmic egg. Um, so, and, and nationalism is, is really just a demonic force. This sort of, my nation is the best, that's Hitlerism, that's, that's uh, you know, that's kind of Stalinism, actually, in its, in its <clears throat> nationalist orientation. That's demonic nationalism. 